And to answer that, let's have a look at the density of the normal distribution, which is also termed the Gaussian distribution, and which is defined as 1 divided by the square root of 2 pi times sigma times e raised to the power of minus 1 half times x minus mu divided by sigma squared. And this now is a density, meaning the integral over all possible values of x is 1. And this is commonly denoted as n of x, which is this parameter. But it also has two other parameters, namely the mu and the sigma, which is typically given as sigma squared. And this is termed the mean, and this is the variance, whereas sigma then is the standard deviation, which is the square root of the variance. And this density plays a major role in modeling probabilities in this course as well as in general. Now let's first have a look at the second step in our base filter. As you remember, our new belief was some normalization constant times the probability of measuring c when we are at x times our predicted belief with an overline that we are in x. And so we will now model all those beliefs using normal distributions. So in that case, our belief overline will be a variable which is normal distributed, where the normal distribution is given by mu overline, which is the mean, and a sigma overline squared, which is the variance. And so this will look like that. Robot will be somewhere at mu, and we will have this single peak with a standard deviation of sigma overline. And this density will be the result of a previous move. And now as for this other part, this will be normal distributed as c, given the mean at x, and a measurement noise, which we denote as sigma q squared. And so this here will be sigma q. And we will add here a multiplication factor, which in our explanation used to be 1. But in general, think of it as a factor that is needed to transform from your state space, the x, to your measurement space. For now, you could just assume that your robot's position is given in centimeters, whereas your measurement is given in millimeters. And so you need this additional factor. This factor will become interesting later on when we deal with multidimensional distributions. And so now all we hope for is that our resulting belief will be normal distributed as well, with a mean of mu and a variance of sigma square. And if that is really the case, so that our final belief is also normal distributed, all we have to do is to compute our new mu and our new sigma square as some function of our predicted mu and sigma square and our measurement and our measurement noise, the variance sigma q square and other values as for example our multiplier c. So and this would mean instead of having to deal with all those approximations to distributions using arrays and using multiplication of those arrays, all we have to do is to compute those two scalar values, which are the first and second moments of our distribution, from the other first and second moments and some other parameters. Now let's find out if this is really normal distributed. And this is easy to see. Let's write down our equation again. Now for this back here, we have to write e raised to the power of minus one half times x minus mu divided by sigma. Whereas for this, we have to write e raised to the power of c minus cx divided by sigma q. And now those two distributions have to be normalized and this is done by some other normalization factor. Now instead of multiplying, we can also add the exponents. Let's write this as minus one half c minus cx divided by sigma q plus one half x minus mu divided by sigma. And now we see the following. This term here is quadratic in x. So all we have to do is to rearrange those terms in order to end up in an exponent that looks like this, x minus mu divided by sigma, which is also quadratic in x. So since we know we can transform any quadratic function in x into this form, we know that our resulting x will be distributed as a normal distribution. And so our first conclusion is belief of x is normal distributed. And all we have to do now is to find those mu and sigma values by rearrangement of those terms. Now remember, if I have any quadratic function, I can write it in this form, which means that plotting it will result in a parabola which has its minimum value at b and the minimum value itself is c and this is for a larger than zero. And if I compute the derivative of this function, I will get a times x minus b and if I set this to zero, I will get 
x equals b. So by setting the first derivative of any quadratic function to zero, I will get this b. Now if I do the second derivative, what remains here is a. So meaning if I have any complicated quadratic function, which contains some x square, x and constants, I can just compute the first derivative, set it to zero and I obtain the b above here. And then I do the second derivative with respect to x and this will give me the a up here. And we will use this trick to rearrange our exponent. So in our case our function quadratic in x is 1 half times 1 divided by sigma q squared times c minus cx squared plus 1 half times 1 divided by sigma squared over line times x minus mu over line squared. So we'll just form the derivative which is 1 divided by sigma q times the derivative of x here which is minus c plus and this should be zero. So we're looking for the solution x for which the first derivative becomes zero. So we group it according to x and we obtain the solution x equals right and this here is the b we were looking for. And we also compute the second derivative and this is easy to see here because we group this according to x then the second derivative just is this part here. So this is c squared divided by sigma q squared plus 1 divided by sigma over line. And this is our a. And now we're basically done. Because now our representation is lambda times e raised to the power of minus 1 half times a times x minus b squared plus some c. And this should be some other alpha times e raised to the power of minus 1 half x minus mu squared divided by sigma squared. And so we see the a equals 1 divided by sigma squared, whereas the b is simply mu. And so with the formulas from the previous slide, we get the result. Our new sigma squared of our posterior distribution is 1 divided by c squared divided by sigma q squared plus 1 divided by sigma over line squared. And then our new mu is this here, sigma squared times c, the constant, times our measurement c, divided by sigma q squared plus mu over line divided by sigma over line squared. This is what we initially wanted. So we now know our belief of x, that is a normal distribution of x with mu and sigma squared, and those here are the values. And now conventionally those formulas are given in a different way. So let's reformulate them. So this is what we obtained. Now let's write that differently. So this is c divided by sigma q squared times c. And now we just subtract c mu over line and we add c mu over line. So this is what we do here, that's just zero plus this part. But now we group it differently. So we obtain sigma squared plus the second part here, which is c squared divided by sigma q squared times mu over line plus mu over line this part here divided by sigma over line squared. And now this part here that is c squared divided by sigma q squared plus 1 divided by sigma over line squared times mu over line. And as we have seen this part here is actually 1 divided by sigma squared. So this cancels out with this. And so we obtain sigma squared divided by sigma q squared times c times c minus cu over line plus mu over line. And now we define this here to be k, the Kalman gain. And so writing it with this k, we obtain our new mu is the old mu here plus Kalman gain times c minus c mu over line. And this is the formula which is conventionally given. Now let's have a look at this formula once again. So this is our predicted state. And as you remember, this is the factor which converts from our state space into our measurement space. So this is the predicted measurement. And in the most simple case, c is just 1. And so the state is identical with the measurement that is predicted. Now this is the actual measurement. And so the difference here, that's the difference between what we measured and what we expected to measure. And that is also called the innovation. And so the innovation is multiplied with the Kalman gain and then add it to the predicted state. So this is the same. Predicted state is here and here. So say for the sake of this example c is just 1. And now let's explore the two cases. Say k is 0. 
Then from that it would follow that our new mu is our old mu overline, our predicted mu overline, plus 0 times something, which is just our predicted mu. That means if my gain is 0, my posterior will completely ignore any measurement and it will just take my predicted mu as my corrected mu. Whereas if k is 1, then what follows the mu then is mu overline plus c minus mu overline, which is c. So if the gain is 1, then what comes out is my measurement. So in this case, the computation will completely ignore my predicted mu and will just take the measurement value as my new state. Now conventionally, the Kalman gain is also given in a different form. So we defined it as sigma square divided by sigma q square times c. Now if I substitute this sigma square here, I obtain c divided by sigma q square times c square divided by sigma q square plus 1 divided by sigma overline square. And this is the same as this. And now if we multiply this by sigma overline square, we obtain k equals c times sigma overline square divided by c square times sigma overline square plus sigma q square. This is the conventional form as it is given in a Kalman filter. And you can see the larger our measurement noise, so the larger our variance down here, the smaller will be our Kalman gain. And if you remember the explanation on the last slide, if our Kalman gain is smaller, we will take our measurement less into account. And now since we have defined our k, we can also try to express our new sigma square in terms of k. So what we obtained so far was sigma square is 1 divided by c square divided by sigma q square plus 1 divided by sigma overline square. And if I multiply the numerator and the denominator both by sigma q square times sigma overline square, I obtain this. And this is the same as 1 minus c square sigma overline square divided by c square sigma overline square plus sigma q square times sigma overline square. And this seems to be much more complicated. But now remember from the previous slide, this here was k. And so we obtain the really simple result. Our sigma square is 1 minus common gain times our c times sigma overline square. And this is the third formula we need. And so this formula makes perfect sense. Now we had the following situation. We were somewhere. We moved forward. Our sigma will become larger and then we hit the measurement and after the measurement our sigma became smaller again and you can see that perfectly here so this blue curve corresponds to this predicted sigma value and this is multiplied by something if our common gain is zero then it follows that our corrected sigma is the same as our predicted sigma because that here will be one whereas in other cases it follows that our corrected sigma because I subtract this from 1, will be smaller than our predicted sigma. And it is this smaller here, which we see in this curve. So overall, for our correction step, our belief was given by that formula. And we said this will be normal distributed according to our prediction. And this will be normal distributed according to our measurement. And now we have proven that this will be normal distributed also with mu and sigma square. Remember, we were looking for this big function containing mu, overline, sigma, overline, and so on. We have this function now. We have to compute our Kalman gain. And from that, we compute our new mu, which is our predicted mu, plus the Kalman gain times c, the measurement, minus the predicted measurement. And our sigma square equals 1 minus Kalman gain times c times sigma overline square. And this is the formulas for the correction step of our Kalman filter. And so we can compute our new mu and sigma square of our new distribution. So instead of having to deal with all those distributions and some discrete form, all we have to do is compute mu and sigma square from all the other given values. And so all the filtering reduces to just maintaining those two variables, the first and second order moments of our distribution. Now the prediction is still missing. So you remember in the prediction belief overline of xt equals a sum. And now since we move to the continuous case, the sum becomes an integral of the probability that we end up in xt 
if we have been in x t minus 1 previously and we received the control u t times the belief that we were in x t minus 1 previously. So this is the continuous version of this tree, which you certainly remember. And again, this belief will be modeled as a normal distributed variable. So this is normal distribution of x t minus 1 with mean mu t minus 1 and standard deviation t minus 1. So and this is clear, it represents the position at a certain point in time. And regarding the probability of ending up in xt when we were in xt minus 1 and we were given the control ut, we define a motion model. So say we have been in xt minus 1, this here, before, and now we moved, and this movement shall be given by a linear part plus the addition of the control. So together that is actually an affine transform. And after this movement our probability will look like that. And so for any given value xt we can look up the probability here. So our distribution will be the normal distribution of xt given this center which is a xt minus 1 plus the control ut and our sigma which now will be the sigma of the movement also termed the system noise. Now that means what we have to compute is integral over e raised to the power of minus one half, now this is the first part, times xt minus a xt minus one plus u squared divided by sigma r times the second part which is e raised to the power of minus one half times xt minus one minus mu t minus one divided by sigma t minus one squared d xt minus one. And now again this is a multiplication of two exponential functions, each of which has an exponent which is quadratic in xt minus 1 and also quadratic in xt. And if we sort out all the xt squared and xt minus 1 squared, we have still to integrate it. Now what do you think? Will the result be, after integration, normal distributed or not?